Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to our Crohn's Disease 101 video chat. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Alyssa Strauss. I'm one of the patient education managers with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation, and we're happy you could be here. So perhaps you may have been recently diagnosed or your family member has been recently diagnosed with Crohn's disease, or perhaps you were diagnosed a while ago and you're still not really fully understanding. Um, today's the night we're gonna learn a little bit more about Crohn's disease, because it can be scary and it can be overwhelming, but learning about it as much as you can will really help you become an informed and effective partner in your care. So I'm excited tonight to be joined by our two guests. We have Dr. Elisa Bowden, who is a gastroenterologist with Virginia Mason Medical Center in Seattle, Washington. She's also an active member of our foundation's patient education committee. And we also have Tom DeBorsi, who's a patient uh, with Crohn's disease from Harrison, New York. And he's a member of our uh, national patient education advisory task force. So thank you guys. Thank you both for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. So for the next 30 minutes or so, we have Tom and Dr. Bowden, who are going to be answering a lot of our questions about symptoms, treatment, management of Crohn's disease. We want to first give a big thank you to the sponsors of tonight's program. We have Bristol Myers Squibb, Genentech, Gilead Sciences, and Pfizer. And additional support is provided through the foundation's annual giving program and our donors. We do want this to be interactive, so there is a chat box below the video. Tell us who you are, where you're from, and of course, ask your questions. And just a few disclaimers before we get started. The information provided on tonight's chat is meant for educational purposes only. The views shared during the chat do not represent the official position of the foundation. And as always, consult with your physician when making any changes to your IBD treatment regimen. So tonight's topic is about Crohn's disease. And if you have questions about other topics related to IBD, we won't have time to get to them tonight, but we do wanna encourage you to reach out to our IBD Help Center with your questions. And you could email us. The email address is info at Crohn'sColitisFoundation.org, or you can call us. The number is 1-888-MY-GUT-PAIN. So, all right, that's out of the way. Let's get started. So we're going to start with Dr. Bowden. We're going to start with the very basics. Can you explain to us what Crohn's disease is and how is it related to inflammatory bowel disease or IBD as we call it? Sure. So inflammatory bowel disease is really the parent term that we use that describes uh, disorders that are characterized by chronic inflammation of the gastrointestinal tract. Um, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are types of inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and, uh, and they are caused by uh, chronic inflammation. Um, they're a little bit different from one another. So we distinguish Crohn's disease from ulcerative colitis because Crohn's disease can occur anywhere along the gastrointestinal tract. So it can happen, there can be inflammation anywhere from the mouth all the way to the anus, whereas ulcerative colitis only involves the colon or the large intestine. Um, Crohn's disease, unlike ulcerative colitis, also affects all three layers of the GI tract, um, whereas ulcerative colitis affects only the inner lining. And this means that inflammation in Crohn's disease can sometimes cause complications that are very rare in ulcerative colitis. Um, for example, Crohn's inflammation can travel through the wall of the intestine and create a hole that extends to other organs. Um, and when this happens, uh, it's called a fistula. Um, the other thing that can happen in patients with Crohn's disease is that there can be extensive scarring, and when this occurs in all three layers of the intestinal tract, it can lead to something called a, a stricture, which is a narrowing of the intestines. Thank you. All right, so you told us about the differences between the two. So my next question is about being diagnosed with Crohn's disease. So how would a patient be diagnosed with Crohn's disease? Yeah, so generally our patients are going to be presenting with some symptoms that bring us, um, bring them to our attention. Um, and, and the intestinal inflammation in Crohn's disease um, causes symptoms like diarrhea or rectal bleeding and sometimes abdominal pain. Um, a patient might get an imaging study like a CT scan that could show inflammation in the intestinal tract that would be suggestive of Crohn's disease. 
Um, also, sometimes we can see evidence of inflammation on blood work or in the stool samples. Um, but the definitive diagnosis is really made during an endoscopy or a colonoscopy when samples of the intestine uh, can be studied under the microscope. Okay, and so patients may want to know sort of, you know, they were diagnosed, what, what caused it? Did they do something to cause it? Is it genetic? What would maybe may make one person, you know, disposed to it versus another? So if you could share a little bit about that. Yeah. So um, first of all, it is absolutely not their fault. Um, we, we actually don't really know what causes Crohn's disease. Um, we think there's probably an environmental trigger that happens in a person who has genetics that make them susceptible to the disease and that that results in an inappropriate immune response, probably to the bacteria that are typically supposed to live in harmony with us within our intestines. Um, in patients without IBD, the body can shut down this in inflammation that's happening in response to these bacteria, but in Crohn's disease, the inflammation um, persists. It doesn't uh, get turned off. Um, and there's really, there's not one gene that controls whether a person will get Crohn's disease, um, but over 200 genetic variants have been shown to make small contributions. Um, so people who have parents or siblings with Crohn's disease and share some of those genes are more likely to get Crohn's disease than the general population, but still the overall risk of a parent or a sibling getting Crohn's disease is still quite small because there has to be that second environmental trigger. Okay, thank you. So Tom, I'm going to shift over to you. So I know you had shared with me you were diagnosed um, with Crohn's disease when you were a teenager. Can you share a little bit about your story of when you were diagnosed, what was happening, and sort of what was sort of going through your mind, you know, when you found out you had it? Sure. Uh, yeah, so I uh, first started uh, feeling symptoms as I was, you know, uh, 13. I, I was diagnosed right around when I uh, turned uh, 14 years old. Uh, so I've had Crohn's for about uh, 23 years, and um, what it really... Um, it was, you know, uh, a, a, a significant shift for me, uh, just absolutely tremendous uh, and unrelenting stomach pain, uh, uh, gas and bloating, and then um, uh, probably 25, 30 uh, times a day I was visiting the bathroom, uh, uh, constant blood in my stools, if that complete, and, and also... Um, sort of going to the bathroom in order to try to relieve some of that stomach pain and uh, and it really it just uh, wouldn't go away and uh, and so uh, as uh, about a month or two passed um, we went uh, my parents took me to my pediatrician and then we got a referral to a gastroenterologist which um, then we had an, I had an upper GI and then a colonoscopy and I was diagnosed at that point and actually uh, being diagnosed for me um, uh, was a relief to me because otherwise I, you know, at least there was something I, I knew what it was, or uh, there was something that could be treated versus sort of uh, this unknown factor. And so I, I actually found it somewhat of a relief, at least, you know, so that, that I could get the counsel of a doctor and sort of, you know, go about kind of getting the treatment as well. Thank you. So um, we know that it's a chronic disease and there are currently no cures, but there are a lot of options as far as treating Crohn's disease. So Dr. Bowden, I know there's a lot of options out there. Can you maybe share with us um, some of the most common treatment options um, that are available for patients right now? And maybe share a little bit, um, once you go through that, you know, how you um, decide the best course of treatment. Sure. So I think it's actually a really exciting time in terms of developments for medication treatment of Crohn's disease. Um, we have a number of FDA approved treatments now, and there are actually a number of medicines that are really pretty far along in the pipeline. So um, I think it's a time when we have lots of options to treat people. Um, the medications that we use to treat Crohn's disease in general turn down the volume on the immune response. Um, so I, I told you guys that this is a disease where the immune response can't really turn off. Um, and so these medicines help to turn it down. 
Um, there are some medicines that target the communication pathway of the immune cells, and these are called cytokines. Um, the medicines are called anti-cytokines, but the way that the immune cells uh, communicate are through these uh, factors called cytokines. And you may have heard of some of these type of medicines. These include um, anti-TNF medications, such as infliximab, adalimumab, and sertilizumab. Um, and then also the anti-IL-12-23 medication, ustekinumab. And essentially what these do is these medications prevent the immune cells from communicating and coordinating with one another, and that helps to shut down inflammation. Um, another class of medications that we are using uh, as well uh, works a little bit differently, and these are uh, called the anti-integrins. Um, the one that's FDA approved right now is called vetalizumab. And these medications prevent immune cells from getting inside the intestine to cause damage. So the immune cells circulate in the blood, and what these medications do is, preventing, is prevent them from getting from the blood into the intestine. And one of the advantages of these medicines are that because they work only in the intestines, it tends to be less immune suppressive than some of the other anti-cytokine medications. Um, Alyssa, you also asked me how we figure out what medications to use in which patient. And this is a really tricky thing because there are so many medications and so many more medications coming along. Um, when I'm thinking about what medications I might recommend to a patient, the idea is really to pick a medicine that's going to be the most effective and have the fewest side effects for the individual patient. Um, right now, we really don't have any big clinical trials um, that show that one medicine is better than any other um, in the same patient population. So picking a medicine is really an individualized decision based on the characteristics of the patient and the characteristics of the disease. Um, I can give a few examples here. Um, for uh, one example, um, some medicines may be, may be more effective for patients who have inflammation in places outside the intestines. So some patients um, with inflammatory bowel disease, such as Crohn's disease, can have joint inflammation. Um, uh, or for patients who may have fistulas, there are certain medications um, that we just have more evidence that they work in, in those settings. Um, we would wanna pick a medicine in a patient who had joint inflammation that actually um, uh, doesn't only work inside the intestine. We would want a medicine that works uh, in the entire body. So that would be one thing that would push us towards maybe using an anti-cytokine medication. Um, another thing we might take into consideration is if a patient has a second autoimmune disease because, um, because of the genetic underpinnings of these diseases, sometimes patients have more than one. They might have uh, skin inflammation from psoriasis or eye inflammation, um, and picking a medication that's been shown to use in that second disease might be really helpful. We might be able to um, treat both diseases with one medication. Um, so right now, we're sort of limited. We're making a best educated guess in terms of who is going to do best with what medication. But I will say this is an area of research that is really, really um, important for the future of inflammatory bowel disease uh, medical treatment. And there are many, many people who are working on developing tests that will hopefully help us to predict who will respond um, best to which medication and who also might have side effects to um, which medication. And you know, my hope for the future is that we'll be able to do these tests before a patient gets started on a medication and prevent some of the trial and error that um, is, uh, uh, is happening right now and how we treat patients. And I just have a follow-up um, for you on that. So we have probably people listening who are adults and those who are caregivers. And I know you're an adult GI, but is there a difference um, in treating adults versus children with Crohn's disease? Yeah, so I'm an adult doctor, but um, you know, in general, we use many of the same medications in adults and children. I would say the one area that I think are um, pediatric GIs are um, a little bit more advanced is in using dietary therapies. Um, so um, they, uh, the evidence that we have so far, again, we don't have lots of evidence on diet, but the evidence that we have so far suggests that it works uh, fairly effectively in children. Again, less evidence in adults. And so I think our pediatricians are much more aggressive about using diet therapies. 
Okay, great. Yes, and we're going to go into that in a little bit for diet for sure. So stay tuned. Um, so Tom, I want to ask you, you know, in your journey uh, with Crohn's disease, you've had to switch, I know you've shared with me, you've had to switch medications over the years. So, you know, until you found one that worked best for you. So can you share um, in your own words, sort of how, what your journey was like, and then, you know, how you worked with your doctor to make that decision? Sure. Um, so yeah, been on uh, biologic medications uh, continuously for about the last 13 years. Um, and uh, I guess uh, my first medication, uh, I was really given the option, uh, you know, my doctor, uh, you know, kind of told me the, uh, the efficacy is relatively similar, uh, but, but there's a convenience difference. Uh, one uh, involves self-ejection, the other involves an infusion. And um, when I heard that and they explained it to me, um, initially I thought that self-ejection uh, would be a little scary. Um, however, after doing it once uh, or twice, I guess, which was the induction dose, uh, it was uh, super easy. And uh, and I, uh, I love the convenience of it. Um, it worked fantastically for me for um, six years. And uh, uh, however, um, there are risks uh, with the medications of developing uh, antibodies or the, bio the biologic drug to uh, stop working. Um, I experienced that um, and uh, that could be very difficult, both, you know, kind of uh, psychologically in terms of you sort of feel like your body's letting you down, but then also, um, you know, I became very anemic and, and uh, had some other issues. Uh, so um, in terms of switching uh, to that medication, I had to go through a washout period of several months uh, while well, I was having a, you know, a pretty severe flare, um, and, uh, but then uh, got on another medication that now I've been on for about, um, about five years and still been very successful with it. And so, um, you know, for me, you know, I think, you know, that, that my doctor probably does the best job in terms of assessing efficacy, um, you know, what, what may be best for me. And I think that would override uh, any consideration about convenience, but all else being equal, um, I I personally really love the convenience of being able to self-administer it versus having an infusion. Um, but um, if given the option of a more efficacious drug, I would you know I would be very flexible. Thank you. So Dr. Bogart, you know, you know, you heard Tom said that you know medication stopped working and he had to make some new choices. So you know, as far as um, moving on from medication, sometimes some patients may require surgery. And so um, can you share with us, you know, when that might be the right time to consider surgery um, and what maybe are some common surgeries that some Crohn's disease patients might have to consider? Yeah, so um, we, you know, a well-timed surgery can be a really, really good treatment for Crohn's disease in some patients. And we generally start to think about that when a patient has developed what we call a structural disease, meaning the inflammation from Crohn's disease isn't really causing the trouble anymore, but there's been scar tissue that's built up um, in the form of a narrowing of the intestine is very common reason somebody might have this, or they've developed a fistula, which is that hole that, connect, that can connect um, the intestine to another organ. And, um, and in those cases, uh, sometimes medications just are no longer effective. And so removing the segment of the bowel that's involved can be very effective for managing symptoms, especially if they're having blockage symptoms from having a narrowing. Um, the different surgeries that are used to treat Crohn's disease really um, are based on where the patient has the disease, um, as well as what they're needing surgery for. So sometimes um, uh, a piece of the intestine or a piece of the colon can be removed um, and then the ends can be sewn back together. Um, sometimes patients who have more extensive disease in the, in the colon might have to have the colon completely removed. 
Um, and then um, for some patients, especially who have had multiple surgeries or who have narrowings in multiple different spots in the intestine, um, our surgeons can sometimes use technique called a stricturoplasty, which is where they open up the narrowing without taking out the intestine. And this can be a really helpful procedure for some patients to, in order to reduce the amount of bowel that needs to be um, removed. Thank you. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so in addition to medic medical treatments and surgeries, you know, people may be thinking, you know, what can I do on my own or what can I do, you know, in, in conjunction with my doctor? And we talked about diet a little bit. We started, started to preach it, but, you know, what kind of role does diet play in the treatment of Crohn's? And do you have recommendations for patients who are thinking about diet and choosing the right foods to maybe help them manage their symptoms at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think there are many ways that patients with Crohn's disease can really take control of their health. I mean, I think first thing is working with their doctor on a treatment plan, um, addressing any nutritional deficiencies that they may have. Um, and then also really staying up to date with preventative measures like vaccination and cancer screening. Um, and those are things that they can work with their doctor with. Um, getting systems in place so it's easy to remember to take medications and also finding the right mindset and my motivation that makes people wanna keep taking their medicines. Um, being um, uh, exercising on a regular basis can really help and getting good sleep. And there's even some data to suggest that meditation can improve people's quality of life who have inflammatory bowel disease. Um, in terms of diet, um, while we don't have a lot of high quality evidence um, about the role of diet in making inflammation better in inflammatory bowel disease, I think many of my patients do report improvements in their symptoms with diet therapy. And I do encourage patients to try different diet therapies if they're motivated to do so. Um, I think it can be helpful to do this in conjunction with recommendations from their doctor and a dietitian um, so that they can make sure that any individualized medical history is taken into consideration um, that might require some diet modification. So some patients may um, want to be losing weight. Some patients may want to be gaining weight or have nutritional deficiencies that need to be corrected. Um, and then the other thing we always take into consideration is whether somebody might have any narrowings in the intestine that would, um, you know, where we would want them to be on a diet that was modified so that things didn't get stuck on the way through. Um, but I, you know, in general, um, I don't um, specifically promote any uh, particular diet because I don't think we have strong evidence that supports one anti-inflammatory diet over another. But I generally do encourage patients to stick to diets that are low in processed and highly refined foods. Um, and then I also tell all my patients that everyone responds to diet a little bit differently. So it may take some trial and error in order to find a diet that works best for each individual. Thank you. So Tom, I guess I'm gonna to turn to you. Have you ever tried any of the complementary therapies that Dr. Bowden was talking about or found any special diets or um, foods that maybe helped you manage your Crohn's? What maybe, what did you find helpful from your experience? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, just to echo Dr. Bowden's comment, um, for me, you know, managing stress levels is important um, in periods of high stress. Um, well, uh, in the moment, you know, you're focused elsewhere and you can sort of maybe compartmentalize symptoms and pain. Um, it does uh, build up and catch up to you. And so I think um, ways to manage stress is, is important and, uh, you know, self-care and recognizing uh, when that is happening. Um, and I think the other thing for me, I guess, um, that actually very uh, resonated with me was, uh, so I, I did have a bowel infection uh, associated with appendicitis and uh, I do have a stricture and um, I, uh, I ate a mushroom uh, that, uh, and uh, it resulted in me having to take a sick day last week on Tuesday uh, because of that and uh, just completely uh, uh, was uh, uh, ruined my week last week. So uh, there's, uh, that, there's definitely um, uh, things there. I mean, other things that I know, I, I think the other thing for me is really trigger foods. Um, so very spicy foods, um, 
acidic, uh, you know, so like orange juice, uh, you can't pay me to drink uh, at all ever, uh, but, uh, just because of the acidity, it kills my stomach. Uh, peanuts, popcorn, uh, and uh, and then you know when I'm particularly feeling uh, poor, I mean sometimes with things like pasta or other kind of uh, well cooked foods, where you know people would may think that a, sa a salad is very healthy. Well. Uh, when you're r really not feeling well with Crohn's symptoms, it's probably the worst thing that you could eat, at least in my experience. So, so you found by avoiding certain yeah, foods, certain certain triggers and certain certain things that I know don't uh, kind of I guess uh, mesh well with my with uh, especially when I'm feeling symptoms, uh, they're they're helpful. But otherwise, I kind of just follow a normal kind of uh, you know balanced diet. Um, and normally I'm able to eat, you know, uh, fruits and vegetables and that kind of thing and just uh, avoiding particularly acidic uh, foods, the mm -hmm. oranges, grapefruit, those kinds of things I, uh, I do avoid completely. Uh, alcohol as well, um, uh, very limitedly just because uh, it, I, my ability to tolerate it isn't, isn't great. So. Sure. Thank you. So I think we're going to try to wrap it up a little bit now with some sort of general advice and guidance. So Dr. Bodim, for those patients who are having trouble right now managing their, their Crohn's disease, what general advice do you have um, for those patients and those caregivers? Yes, I would encourage patients having trouble um, to work with their physicians to discuss, you know, what management strategies might be right for them. I find a lot of times that my patients get really used to feeling their symptoms. And when we get them on the right treatment pathway, they often tell me that they didn't realize how bad they were feeling before. So just keep the communication up with your doctor. Um, I also encourage all my patients to educate themselves on their disease and its treatment so that they can be a really active participant in decision-making around their care. And the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation is a wonderful, wonderful resource for patients. So I recommend that you explore what they have uh, available for you as you are doing. Um, and then, you know, again, I, I do highly recommend that patients invest in their own self-care, making sure that they're taking care of themselves, sleeping well, exercising, eating well, nurturing themselves, because I think that really, um, you know, there is a strong mind-body connection and doing all of those things also helps people to get healthy. Thank you. And Tom, I'm gonna throw that question for you to you from the patient perspective. You know, what advice would you have for others who are either recently diagnosed or maybe um, encountering, you know, had Crohn's disease for a while, but are encountering some challenges in managing their diagnosis? What, what advice would you have? Sure. Um, I guess for me, I think the most important part is self-advocacy. So, um, you know, there's a, there's a group of illnesses that are invisible Ill illnesses where on the exterior, you don't look like you're sick. Um, and uh, the ability to, you know, uh, know your limitations, um, and not that your 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 life is is limited, but that you know, in certain moments and other things, uh, knowing what you can and can't do. Um, I think the other thing, you know, for me, over the last 23 years, is really I've never viewed my disease as a disability, but more as something that I need to manage on a daily basis and have to pay more attention to just some, than someone else. Um, the other thing that I would emphasize is just uh, whether it's, it's, it's usually been someone else in my life that's pointed it out, but um, knowing when things are not normal. Um, so um, uh, there was a point where I became uh, severely anemic uh, and, uh, you know, uh, fainted, et cetera, needed blood transfusions. And so, uh, you know, uh, there are times that you may need to go to the emergency room um, and, uh, uh, a lot of Crohn's disease patients are used to uh, managing uh, with a lot of things and it's a uh, progression, especially if uh, you're in an active flare. And so uh, knowing when things are not normal, I, I, uh, at that time I couldn't take 10 steps from my, uh, from my bedroom to my, I was in a small one bedroom apartment in New York City to my family room. And uh, uh, then my wife was finally like, we're checking you into the emergency room um, 
And so, you know, know knowing when things are um, not normal. Um, also, um, you know, it, it's a law of self-advocacy. Um, there, there are fantastic doctors. Uh, however, you know, I, I had one doctor who I think felt uh, he was having uh, other issues in, in, in their own life with a sick child. And uh, I was uh, feeling very sick at the time and my doctor wasn't responding to me and really had to go and get a second opinion and, and switch doctors um, because I was really sick at that point and, you know, really was feeling ignored. Um, and so I think um, being able to speak up and advocate for yourself is, is super important. Um, I think also, you know, it is a chronic disease, so it, it's, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, and you really have to be able to, you know, you know think about it that way and, you know, there are times where things are going to be harder and times where things are going to be easier. And so uh, appreciating that. And then maybe uh, just a comment to, to what Dr. Bowden said at the beginning. Um, I'm more optimistic than ever in terms of uh, the amount of treatments that were that are available. Um, the, the treatment that I'm on now when I went on it was not approved for Crohn's disease. And um, even if I would uh, fail the, the drug I'm on now, um, there are multiple other options for me. Uh, at that point, there I, I uh, had uh, almost exhausted all options, and so um, I think that that's one thing that's particularly exciting is the, you know, there's been a lot of research in this area and a, a lot more new treatments with different pathways that give uh, patients a lot more options. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Um, Thank you, Dr. Bowden, Tom, for taking the time to chat with us today. And thank you to everyone who joined in um, online. We thank you all for your commitment to the IBD community. Um, if your final, if your question wasn't answered tonight, um, please contact our IBD Help Center over email, info at Crohn'sColitisFoundation.org, or you can call us 1-888-MY-GUT-PAIN or one 888 6948872. This is actually the second part of a series that we're having. Last week we talked about um, intro to ulcerative colitis. Um, tonight was Crohn's disease. And then our, our third part to the series is on November 10th at eight o'clock Eastern time. And that's uh, effective partnering and the treat to target approach to IBD care. So we encourage you to join us then as well. Thank you all. Thank you, Tom, Dr. Bowden. And thank you all. Have a great evening.